Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Genuine Chit Chat. This week, I speak with my buddy Wayne again, uh, except last week we spoke about what well, we delved into the human condition and sort of, sort of what makes us human, good versus evil, and his two books, um, A Light in the Mist and Scarcrow, uh, two fiction books which I highly recommend people go and check out. Um, but this week, we're actually talking about paleontology, um, because Wayne, as well as being an accomplished author, he also has a degree in paleontology. Now, paleontology is basically just the study of fossils and and animals and plants but also you know the history of life on earth up to essentially human recorded civilization um so we delve into that sort of thing and it's kind of like the the beginner's guide almost for paleontology now some of the topics we discuss in this episode are mass extinction events not just of the dinosaurs but of all the creatures that have lived on earth and sort of things that can that can trigger uh, extinction events and um, we speak about obviously fossils and dinosaurs um, evolution sea bears which are tardigrades which are this crazy animal that can survive through relatively anything we talk about it a little bit you know the jurassic um, and cretaceous period uh, giant insects 3d mapping climate change just general nature we talk about absolutely loads of different things in this podcast it's, it's actually one of my favorites that i've recorded so far and um if you really enjoy this episode that's great um i'd recommend checking out my other sciencey episodes um i've got a mini series with my buddy josh called science but simple um the first one we talk about how light bulbs work and the second one we talk about how um the tides and gravity works it's just basically explaining science in a really simple and easy to digest manner um, which is great for me really so those episodes are also released on this podcast it's all just under one umbrella the genuine chit chat podcast where i'm always the host um so make sure you guys check that out if you're interested um and I'll give more details about that sort of stuff at the end. Um, so I guess after a little cheeky promo, um, we're going to get right into it. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim. Hi, my name is Kit Karen. And we host the Forgotten News Podcast. Jim, I know we're in the middle of recording the promo for our podcast, but a thought just occurred to me. Okay. People praise the future because it is blank and featureless. They're afraid of the past because it is full of real and living things. Wow, Kit, that is absolutely true for most people, but not for us. On our podcast, we tell true stories from before you were born. Stories that made headlines maybe for a day or a week, then disappeared just as suddenly. It might be a true crime story or an unsolved mystery. It might be a strange or spooky story. It might even be a funny story. <laughs> and if you want to hear some exciting stories about Franklin Roosevelt, Susan B. Anthony, or Alexander Hamilton, well, I'm sorry, you'll need to find a different podcast. Yes, indeed. Because our show tells the stories of the footnote people from history. And sometimes the people who didn't even make it into the footnotes. If you are someone who would like to hear lost but true stories from long ago, then you should definitely listen to the Forgotten News Podcast. Yep. The Forgotten News Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, also known as iTunes, and nearly every podcatcher out there so don't be afraid cat just tune in and listen to the forgotten news podcast welcome to genuine chit chat where we have honest conversations with interesting people and i'm your host mike burton Hello there, my friends. We're back with uh, Wayne once again, but this time instead of talking about um, his incredibly interesting books about, well, the God, I don't even describe them now. It's going to be a whole another almost podcast. It's just like, just a really interesting look into the human condition in a way and the dichotomy of the idea between good and evil. So if you if you haven't listened to the uh, podcast before this one, uh, check that one out for this. Uh, but this one is a completely different podcast altogether, um, recorded in the same sitting, but about a different subject. Uh, this one is going to be about paleontology, because as well as being an accomplished author uh, and a general great guy, Wayne is also has a degree in paleontology. So 
as I'm not smart enough to explain it in a very great way, you know, I'm going to ask Wayne to tell people generally what paleontology is and why you sort of got into it and some of the uh, sort of more intriguing things you've kind of learned. And we'll kind of go from there. So paleontology. Okay. Paleontology is basically encompasses everything from the beginning of life up until human appearance. So it can be life's first existence um, 3.78 billion years ago up until, you know, modern humans arrived. So that's like 250, well, now 300,000 years ago. Thanks, Germany. <laughs> so finding out more, we'll go into that a little bit in, later on, but we'll come back to that. But yeah, sorry. But yeah, paleontology basically encompasses all forms of life. So it can be from your three main realms. Um, you can do uh, paleobiology. Um, you could do uh, pa paleoclimatology. It literally has, it, it's just l limitless. Mm -hmm. You can study isotopic data for um, weather systems that have changed over millennia you can do um, you can go into fossil plants you can go into fossil uh, there's a section of it for vertebrate paleontology um, it has real world applications like in the old oil industry you know how to tell how old the shales are that you're drilling will you know obviously equivalent for how um, much net worth your oil is worth mm -hmm. yeah so paleontology it's basically everything prehistoric, literally everything you can think of, you know, up from the last ice age, literally to the dawn of time. It encompasses it all and everything that's um, fossil evidence, but it doesn't even have to be the actual animal itself. Um, so you can have things called trace fossils, which are literally like worm burrows, casts, footprints, um, scour marks uh, left behind from the animal as long as it preludes to the fact that it was there at a time it can be classed as any kind of fossil evidence um but there's also you can go into sedimentology so that's like the the study of, of rock fasces and you you get into sort of continental drift and more of those types of, th of theories so as a subject it is very broad very broad and it it normally coincides with other subjects like geology geophysics all those different kinds of things so it's pretty much your for a subject that was supposed to be quite offset, it's involved in a lot of other things. Yeah, so obviously us, we won't be able to topic, we won't be able to get to everything. We won't be able to just start like, let's, this is Paleontology 101. We're going to teach you everything because you were, were you in you for three or four years or? Three. Three years. So obviously three years of learning all that information. And I imagine like in how much there is to know, your actual percentage knowledge of it is quite minuscule because yeah. by such, it probably sounds like one of the most diverse uh, as you said, with all the little uh, sort of subgenres within it, in a sense, there are so far that you can go into anything. I mean, I think you were telling me um, on the car ride here about there's a per the people you know who literally just study, as you said a minute ago, about uh, plants. Just mm. like literally, just even almost one almost sort of a uh, type of plant, you can just you can spend your entire life, you know, fifty years with a master's degree going through the, just all the things that could be with this one plant, mm. and that's like the amount of plant species that not only exist right now but also have existed not to mention all the from plants to animals to everything as you say it's such a it's basically just everything from before a point and it's like yeah. well that's everything you know and there's, yeah. there's so much to know and there's so the one of the examples is like how what we know about the past is only what we found or was what mm. recorded and obviously prehistoric as i didn't it didn't really click with me until a few months ago the term prehistoric is prehistory, pre-recording, recorded history from humans. Mm -hmm. So it's like prehistory, uh, prehistoric times is just that's such a vast area. Mm -hmm. And one thing I think is um, I may get these two mixed up, so you will have to correct me. Which came first, uh, the Jurassic or the Cretaceous period? The Jurassic. So, am I right in saying that the different? It wasn't, I think was it the T Rex? It was something like the time period between the Cretaceous period and now is less time than between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous period. That is correct, yes. Yeah, so we are closer to the Cretaceous period dinosaurs, in a sense, than those dinosaurs were to the Jurassic period dinosaurs. Yes, that is correct. That's madness. That's just, mm -hmm. You think about that, you go, Wait, what? Is that? We are closer to... What? <laughs> it's just like those sort of little tidbits are what I love about this sort of thing. And um, So I think a good uh, jumping-off point would be uh, what you said at the start, which is basically... We believed it was about 200,000 years ago, which uh, humans sort of... Uh, that's our, our current understanding of what humans are right now, which is a homo sapien, that we thought the sort of... The first 
ones kind of came from Africa about 200,000 years ago. Um, but recently, uh, it was a tooth, I think you said, yeah. that was found in Germany. Mm -hmm. And it was, was it 250,000 years ago or 300,000 300, years ago? 000. So you can take this off from here because that's all my knowledge. <laughs> that's what I know about it. Yeah, basically, uh, it was a upper molar found from a Homo sapien in the Rhine River in Germany. And it predates the oldest specimens of Homo sapiens in Africa by at least 50,000 years. Mm. So it's completely rewritten the fact that, you know, we, we may have been in Europe before we were in Africa, or maybe we were further globally distributed, or perhaps even Homo sapiens might have been around at that time, and we might have um, migrated from Europe into Africa and then back out to Europe. It's, mm. it, there's so many theories that well, it even, now crops up. You could even say we maybe even did start in Africa, but maybe we started in Africa like 350,000 years ago. Precisely. And we just haven't found the right uh, fossils or anything like that, which is it's one of these things that one of the issues with some of the, <clears throat> some of the scientific world is that there's someone who could be, say, if we use dinosaurs as an example, um, dinosaurs being we didn't used to think they all had feathers, and now it's coming to light that I think we think either all of them or most of them at least had feathers. Yeah. Well, if you had someone before we found out that bit of information, if you had someone before that studying and teaching, um, say, uh, their professor in a university, teaching everyone about dinosaurs for their entire career, 40, 50 years, whatever, about dinosaurs being in this specific way, and then this one piece of evidence or a few pieces of evidence have come out to completely disprove a element of they've been teaching people then often double down and they're the first people to try and be like no that's not right that's that's this there's that blah, blah blah and what ends up happening is you get people in the scientific community who are ironically holding on to their ideas more than the empirical fact which is what they should have been doing the whole time one of the most difficult things of being anyone who studies any of the sciences would be be aware that any relatively anything you know we, if a new theory comes out or a new piece of evidence that could support it or anything along those lines, be aware that your own ideas of life and how things work can not be correct. And you have to be okay with that. Mm. And a lot of people aren't. And one of the things with today's society, not just in the scientific community, but with a lot of the things going with the left and the right, and people have such a hard time admitting when they're wrong. Mm. And it's taken me many years to really be able to grasp the thing of, it doesn't matter if you're wrong because if you if you say something and it turns out you're wrong the way you find out you're wrong nine times out of ten is by someone telling you the right answer yeah so if you're wrong that's fine because then you know you're wrong therefore you know it's right and therefore you're right again yeah so <laughs> there's no problem in having an open mind and accepting when you're wrong because if you're surrounded by the kind of people who openly mock you for being incorrect about something i mean there's there's a bit of jokes and banter you know if you've got a mate and they think that a certain actor was in a film and they really and they definitely weren't you can take the mic it's no biggie but if it's like if there's other things that people really grasp to and people really believed and then it turns out they're incorrect if you surround yourself with people who are generally quite positive and quite uh, sort of feet on the ground but the right amount of head in the clouds of you just have it with a nice balance of you're wrong but that's fine we thought the same way too or we completely understand you thinking that way however this information shows this or that or the other if you have a right network of people around you who can respect your ideas and respect everything then there's no problem yeah. but you get the people who mock each other for being wrong when all that being wrong is is being ill-informed and to be honest Obviously, with the te with technology nowadays and the internet, you can argue that it is uh, a degree of your own what else you put into it. If you want to, uh, if you want to learn more about a certain thing, you do now have the tools to be able to just Google it essentially. But you go back twenty years ago. I mean, even when we were when we were in school together, you know, Facebook and Bebo and that sort of thing was kind of popping up. Yeah. But that we didn't have smartphones until yeah. I think I had a smartphone in college was the first time. So that was when I was like sixteen, seventeen, and. Um, Facebook and stuff, I obviously use Facebook a fair amount and all the sort of social media and jazz. But, like, you go back, yeah, seven years ago, and that wasn't really a thing. I mean, mm. Facebook was, I think it was started 2008, 2009-ish, around that sort of time. And, obviously, depending on it first started at universities and all this sort of other things. So, where it actually became public, it's, you know, the whole other thing, which I don't know enough about. But, um... With without, if you go back twenty years before, or even if you argue thirty years before that, where the internet kind of came about in the nineties, well, before that, finding out information, you either had to research it and hope the library had some information about mm. it, or you just accepted what you were told. Yeah, and that's what I think a lot of the older generation, especially with the political system, are having issues with when they're finding out when they say immigration is costing this amount of money or benefit fraud is causing this or that this is information you're being told by the media and whether or not certain people believe the media is corrupt some people don't i think a lot of the time it is due to the funding that it come gets from is you know from a lot of big businesses and things like that which i'm not going to go into now because i want to talk about paleontology but um you know people they 
they double down these ideas and they, they didn't have it at a time where now, you know, when your crazy aunt or grandparent says something that's a bit stupid and you go, that's not actually right. And they go, yes, it is. I was like, well, now you can pull out a device and prove them wrong. And it's like, it's not about proving someone wrong. It's about everyone being as well informed as possible. Mm. But you go back 30 years ago, we didn't have the ability to be able to do that so easily. So it's more understandable why so many other people, especially in the scientific community, had such issue with when their ideas get uh, get flipped on their head. Mm. So I thought I'd ask you, um, what what kind of, obviously, you, you did, the way you describe paleontology just then makes any, well, makes me think, why who wouldn't want to go into it? But what kind of, what made you want to go into university uh, for paleontology, like specifically? Uh, and then sort of what's, what's some of the most interesting things you think you found about that? What are the sort of specialist areas you like and what sort of kind of pulled you and kept you interested? Okay. Um, well, to go into it, I've, I've had a love for paleontology since I was five because mm. it was literally like Jurassic Park, um, prehistoric park with, you know, with Nigel Marvin and those mm. sort of TV series always got me hooked. Um, I wanted to go into paleontology specifically for the dinosaurs. I think a lot of people love dinosaurs when they were younger. Dinosaurs are so cool. <laughs> I, just, I want to say, like, dinosaurs are amazing. I just want to carry it. It's like that, that side thing. But yeah, sorry. Yeah. And, you know, so you go into it and then you discover that it's like way, way bigger. You know, it's, mm. it's it covers so many different subjects. So I went into uni and I thought, right, okay, literally the whole of life what part is going to interest us the most? And we actually did a, a project in our third year. Um, we went down to Dorset and we actually found uh, the articulated skull of an ichthyosaur uh, oh, from, wow. from the Black Ven Formation. Uh, it's from the Upper Cinnamurian, which is about 194 million years old. Jesus. From the Middle Jurassic. Even seeing something like that existing is just mind-blowing, it, just knowing that. And I just want to side thing is just with, when I'm sure i sure that you got really into um, the Natural History Museum in London, mm. things like that, where you go there, and there's a lot of uh, dinosaur bones, that sort of thing, which a lot of them, as we discussed before the podcast, are casts and things, because you can't actually always have a whole dinosaur skeleton, because mm. nine times out of ten, only certain parts of it are actually viable to... To, uh, big enough to actually even be seen as a, mm. a bone a lot of the time it's fragments or you've just got you've seen you've had say a thousand uh, T-Rex skeletons you found mm -hmm. and you found different parts of each one and you kind of can make up you know what a general one is so they make mm. up the casts from other ones to make it so people go to the Natural History Museum and stuff not all of them are dinosaur bones just to clarify but seeing all those things it, it really it made me really interested in this sort of stuff in science. And I just want a little thing and say, when I was in school, science really bored me. Mm. I, I thought the way they taught it, I did applied science, which is very boring. But um, the way they taught a lot of it was just, I wasn't even necessarily that keen about experiments necessarily. Mm. It's just some of the information they told you, some of the formatting and stuff was just not for me. And as soon as I got out of school, and once the internet became such a big thing, whenever I have these random questions, just two o'clock in the morning wondering what black holes actually are even though you go into that and you go <laughs> you go so far deep it just you're up there for hours but um just having that ability to look on the internet and just help reignite the sparks of my interest mm. now that i'm an adult and i actually can understand it and i can go at my own pace to understand things it's so much more intriguing to me mm. so with, with you and dinosaurs hearing and about that sort of an early life it's uh, the good thing is with our, our growing up we had like jurassic park and as you said mm -hmm. you had um was it prehistoric park and yeah. obviously we had uh, walking with dinosaurs that yeah. sort of thing as well so i just wanted to add that as a side thing but sorry uh, continue with your your um yeah so you got into it with uh with paleontology it was it was a case of um going into it because i thought you know everyone wants to be oh you know i want to i want to become um a barrister or mm -hmm. i want to be a bank assistant or all mm -hmm. this kind of stuff and it's like that's not really interesting you want to you want to be able to wake up in the morning and think I could find something that could rewrite history. Mm. I could I could change the world literally in finding something. And like yeah. I say, when we went down to Dorset and um, we found this articulated ichthyosaur skull, it took us 497 hours to prep this thing out, and we were only half done. Wow! Um, Is that with all the brushes and all the yeah yeah yeah? That's all the um, pneumatic abrasive pens and all that kind of stuff. Um, we've recently just started work on the other side um, okay. using a grout remover. Oh, wow. not. <laughs> um, but it takes it off pretty well. Um, and basically, it had skin still preserved. Wow. Bearing in mind that's 197 million years old. That's phenomenal, because that's the sort of thing that people are talking about with um, this whole other, what was another podcast we could go on about this, but like with the cloning and stuff. Mm. It's like the idea that they've, I think, was it a dying, they basically had a chicken that they managed to make with a reptilian head or something, apparently, mm. with, I think it was the BBC post about it uh, recently. Um, and it was basically, they, they got a tiny, they had a tiny amount of DNA, I think from bone marrow or something along mm -hmm. those lines, or a bit of skin. And they somehow managed to, 
when they had a chicken laying an egg, I don't know because I'm not smart enough to understand this, but they basically managed to, layman's terms, splice it almost and make it so that this being was born with a bit of DNA from these things. And like when you have, you need soft tissue, I think it is, to be able to to replicate it in the same sort of way. So, and also, you know, something being, something, you got to think like something even being a few hundred years old and still having skin on it. Like you you dig up, if you went grave digging and stuff and you found humans, uh, like, remains a lot of them i don't know how long it is specifically but you become skeletons fairly regularly quick because of bacteria and other three weeks. insects three weeks there you go so you know so that's what i mean so you've got to think like um, like a couple of months that's like quite a big deal to almost find skin mm-hmm. and then decades but you're thinking longer that's such a long period of time that is it's the thing is of when you go into millions humans can't fathom a million because you like to think you can yeah. because when you think of a million you go oh the number a million one and then you know six zeros after it it's like yeah but no one's really ever counted a million things, mm. as in one, two, three. Obviously, you've got computers that can, or maybe you've got a, a catalogue of books, and you know in this library there's a million of them. But visualising a million in actual physicalities is so hard. And then when you add time to that, try not, so how many times have we had memories where you just go, oh, yeah, that was a, you know, that was a couple of months ago. Someone goes, mate, that was like a year and a half ago. And yeah. you're like, what? But the humans haven't even been around at all for as we were just discussing you know say 300,000 years to our current knowledge mm-hmm. well that's a, that's like less than a third of 1 million you know that's 195 million years ago that's I'm jealous of you after you pursue this career path so it's kind of like rewarding in that in that regard mm-hmm. obviously I've done nothing to do that career so I don't deserve to find <laughs> it like that but that must have been next level finding something with a bit of skin on it that's just phenomenal yeah. so when you when you found that what sort of other stuff uh with that still with a that find what what does that what what, what have, have you learned anything specific from that i know you haven't managed to get it out but like yeah um from the skin um there were like dark patches called melanosomes um which are used um for fossil feathers as well and if the right iridescence is portrayed and you put it on uh what they call backscatter um, cinematography and uh, scanning electron microscopy, which we used on a sample of the skin, you could actually tell what color the ichthyosaur really? was. Unfortunately, um, when we conducted um, the experiment on it, um, it, unfortunately the skin was was too damaged to to be able to tell. But from previous studies that have been done, um, ichthyosaurs are genuinely considered to be black. Okay. So walking with dinosaurs you know when you see the gray sort of dolphin type look they were more thought as black it would make more sense because they were deep sea hunters they would have hunted squid and that kind of thing Hmm. um so yeah it it's it it definitely gives you the opportunity to stand with the highest ranking of paleos and you could have only just started yesterday Hmm. that's that's the good thing about it there's no hierarchy system you Hmm. could find something that could trump someone who's been in the business for 50 years yeah that's the the thing that interested me in paleontology and drew me to it. Because Opening I thought, the door sort of thing. Yeah, of course. And all the theories that they came up with, for one, evolution, the one thing about evolution that people can test is the lack of evidence. They say, oh, yeah, but you've got missing links between like dinosaurs and birds. Mm-hmm. Right? You've got so many. The evolution of horses, you have them going from something that was the size of a cat mm-hmm. to today. You have them losing limbs. Mm-hmm. You don't think of a horse as having five toes. It did at one point. Mm. You have all these different stages and you have the fossils there because in a short space of time, the evolution of the horse occurred. It was like something like 3.5 million years. It was nothing. Blink mm. of an eye in the mere scheme of time. Yeah. But when you have something like between dinosaur groups, something that's quite rare to find. I mean, loads of dinosaurs have been found, but in themselves, they're quite rare finds, especially fully articulated, like you said earlier. Mm. And the point is being able to contribute and find a fossil that, slots into one of those gaps just it it does your self-credit because you think to yourself you know charles darwin all those years ago he must have thought to himself do you know what this is just a stupid theory i I have no way of proving this Mm. you know like any kind of physicist or anyone in the in the sciences that comes up with a theory and thinks there's nowhere i can test this nowhere i can prove it and then future generations go and prove it for them it's Mm. almost like you know legacy yeah if the darwin is one of for me one of the most obviously a lot of people held this view one of the most important people Mm. who've ever lived because it does what he found and what he realized just the stepping stone and the general idea Mm. has opened the door to such an on mass of findings and he was uh, obviously critiqued by primarily who was in power at the time which is obviously a lot of religion was uh, Mm. in power at the time who from history a lot you know the dark ages all these sorts of other things and with galileo as well with his idea of um, i think he was the one who discovered that we were orbiting the uh the sun and things and it's like 
all these brilliant minds due to people who not necessarily just blaming religion but people holding on to these beliefs that they refuse to let go of that they refuse to change and science nowadays especially with so many more people into it and so much more evidence and better technology i mean there's like um with ultrasound and things there have been uh planes and things that have flown over south america and found like ruins that are under the surface by quite a far well and they are miles in size and we because we just hadn't dug in the right spot, we hadn't found them. Yeah. And as technology is going to get better and better, we're going to be able to use ultrasound to such a fine, specific degree. Mm. Be able to fly over um, a cliff, do a bit of ultrasound, and you go, well, there's something. You know, may, we, Our normal excavations only go, say, I don't know how far down they go, but let's say 10 metres if we dig that deep. But they go, oh, well, this is actually 50 metres down. We would mm. never dig that deep in a cliffside just for no reason, this one specific spot. Mm. So we're getting the tech to be able to do that. And with people like yourself and... Uh, all the other people who loved dinosaurs when they were younger and this sort of thing. People have this passion and really want to make a difference. All people who just want to fuel their own knowledge of these things will help curb the future generations. You know, mm. your findings or the findings of your team, even if it's one th- small thing to you or one small thing that it may seem to the whole community, that is adding another page in the book of someone's going to pick up one day and read through it all as one big thing and be like, this is amazing. This is what I love. Yeah. And they, although your finding may not change the world like Darwin did, mm. it adds, you know, you can't have a glass of water without drops. You yeah. know, each, the whole, it's a one glass of water, but everything in there can be taken away drop by drop. Mm. And that's what science is. It's mm-hmm. adding, even if it's one drop at a time, just adding to that big picture that slowly, as we, I've described this before, is, um, and you can use this example in almost every, any walk of life, is, with science, I look at it as where we are now, as because the modern technology we've only had, you know, electricity working properly for about 150 years or so, um, and even now we've 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 got TVs and stuff. In the last 30 years, has been accelerating due to the technological revolution. Obviously, the industrial revolution as well helped that as well, and like, all these things adding to it. And it's like our current understanding of the universe, both with the ideas of spirituality as well as core science and things, and consciousness and the universe and potential other realities as well as evolution and the animals and the beings that could have walked the earth before our modern day humans you look at that and the way it is is we're basically an infant looking through a keyhole Mm. into an an atrium and we think or certain people believe that they know all the answers because they think that what they've seen through the keyhole is the whole picture when in reality and i say this when you're literally when you're a child whereas you become an adult when you're an adult, you're basically, when you're a child, basically, you're looking through the keyhole and you can only just see things. And when you're a teenager, you look through the keyhole and then you're like, I've seen that lampshade. I know exactly what's in the room. Mm-hmm. When you're an adult, the door gets opened. You don't necessarily even get let in the room. But you then stand there and you realize you knew nothing mm-hmm. about what was in that room. You thought that thing was a lamp. To be honest, it was a, it was a picture, like a, a painting. And in that painting was a lamp. Yeah. And it was like, that's not even relevant to anything else that's in this whole room. And that's kind of what science is. Mm-hmm. And science is this where at the start with Galileo and with Darwin and that sort of thing it was almost like a pinprick in a door and now what we thought was it was one door and then what it actually is is you keep taking step backs it's a cliff and to even open that cliff up we can see like a hole the size of probably like a 50p coin of how much we actually know about it especially mm. with evolution and like as the days go by it's someone slowly opening that tiny little hole each day maybe even each year just slowly opening it on this this thing opening that's the size of a cliff. Mm. And even when we actually manage to open up that thing to that size and how many years it's going to take, that's not even going into the into this hypothetical doorway, going down to this hypothetical like cliff with this massive cave system of information. It's like it's so overwhelming, but it's so it's so gratifying in a lot of ways. And one of the things that um like as I've said myself, I'm an atheist and you're a Christian and it's mm-hmm. it's very commendable of you being so open minded with you believing in a deity, which I think is completely fine and it's yeah, as I say, it's completely fine to believe in that, but still going with science and evidence and evolution. And it's very commendable, you know, having your own mind and thinking, this is what I believe in this, but I also believe that and not letting anyone else tell you have to believe this or that. Mm. It's finding your own way because I don't think anyone's right. I think everyone has little pieces of what could potentially be right. Yeah. And um, one, one of the things I say with, we discussed purpose a little bit mm. is in the in the previous podcast, we spoke about it a little bit. And I just find that, the regardless of how you think the world came to be, I think you make your own purpose. Mm. And, but I think the idea of whether you think that a god created you or if you don't, the fact that you're here is just such unbelievable odds to one. Mm. And like any any step you take in any direction is 
everyone is an individual. Humans have very many similarities between us all in so many different ways. And even if you're pursuing a similar career path to someone and you have similar music tastes or all these sort of similarities, everyone is a complete individual. Mm-hmm. And everyone's got their own indi- individual path. And I wouldn't say necessarily that even though Darwin was a massive step forward, and I think there are certain outliers. I think nowadays it's more, there are the odd people who maybe make a bigger impact in the in a public way, like Steve Jobs, as I said in the previous podcast, I think, or maybe it's not this one, who knows. And um, the even if you specifically aren't known to be the Steve Jobs, or aren't known to be this, there are hundreds of paleontologists um, who are who made these discoveries, who maybe aren't that well known, who still made such a big effect and such a big ripple effect on, even if you talk to me and I talk to, if we ignore the aspect of a podcast, I talk to one person I know or I have a kid one day and I talk to them about it and just a bit of information you gave me, I tell them and that sparks something in them. Mm. And even if it's, they make the next Darwin idea or they make the next one of this, it's all of us as a community coming together and learning together and every step we take should be all of us taking a unified step together. Precisely. And I just think what you're doing is just fantastic. And this learning about it is just, even though I keep interrupting you, <laughs> uh, learning about this was just fantastic. And so I'd like you to continue with your with your story with my gigantic tangent. Yeah. But, um, basically, the, the interest um, can go into loads of different things. I mean... Just through going the course through the course of paleontology, uh, I believe on the way back from uni, actually, I, I bumped into Reese on the train, and he was like, "Oh, hey, you know, um, what have you been up to?" And I was like, "I was literally just um, staring at pollen grains." And he what? was like, "Pollen grains? Wow, yeah, that that sounds that sounds amazing." And I was like, "Yeah, it is quite because they're five hundred and ten million years old." Oh Jesus Christ! From like some of the first land plants ever. Yeah, uh, they're they're called rhinia, right? And they're about a centimeter tall, mm. and you think. It's thanks to billions of these that we actually had an atmosphere. Yeah, you know, it's mate, it's crazy. And the awesome things were that just as we thought that plants um, were literally paved the way for life, there was even life at that point as well. Because in one of the pollen grains from one of this rhinia, there was a trigonotarbid. Oh wow! Okay. Actually, inside it, which is like this uh, ten-legged arachnid sort of relative. Mm. Um, that looks sort of like a sea bear. Oh, if okay. You, if ever you've seen well, one of them. Josh's favourite animal, I think, is a sea bear. The, um, do, you know, do you know what the actual term for them is? Because I can never remember. Um, not off the top of my head. That's fine. We'll, we'll, I'll look it up in a minute. But yeah, continue, sorry. But, um, yeah, so one of them being found, um, you know, taking refuge in this in this pollen grain. It's, mm. it, it's absolutely amazing, you know. And it was it was it it came out of a rock formation called the Rhiney Chert, which is basically like these, these huge geysers, which would mm-hmm. basically... Um, spew a load of you know hard sort of chalkish water and that chalk then fossilized these plants and okay. preserved them for 510 million years so madness you can go from studying that to studying something like i say as, as large as you know um, the largest land animal ever to live like a like a titanosaur mm. or you know th- this leg is literally 10 feet tall and that's that's just its femur and yeah, you think the colossal size of that animal. You think about the amount of vegetation, and it, it was They'd have plants. to consume well, as well. Yeah. It would have to like you think of like, people think of like a bear, for example. Mm. They have to eat so many pounds and pounds and pounds yeah. of things. Mm. But we'll just say the water. It was a water bear. I think that's the animal, isn't it? Yeah. It's called a, a, a tardigrade. If anyone wants to uh, look up a tardigrade, a tardigrade as T A R D I G R A D E S. Um, they're basically water dwelling, um, eight legged, se- uh, eight legged segmented micro animals, and they're basically they can survive through anything they think they can survive in space and stuff actually yeah, they, they found yeah, so they're, they're known as extreme files yeah they're like they can survive basically any condition so do you say you found something that was that or something similar to that something similar to that it's like a close relative yeah so even that's just like the these creatures that we couldn't even fathom existing of that can survive some ridiculous conditions and a lot of them being microscopic and this sort of thing mm-hmm. as well it's like well they're in theory there could be some around here but you can't see them because not yeah. everything you're looking at right now is looked at through a microscopic lens our human sight isn't that good exactly. so you finding that in a or you looking at something has found that within it is just opening the door once again to just you can you can even have it where you're just studying plants mm-hmm. and then you could in theory just find this microscopic being that you've never heard or seen before mm-hmm. so it's never never like a downplay the importance of the quote-unquote small roles mm-hmm. of whether it's science, whether it's life, whether it's the bin men, whether it's a, a anyone in life, every part of society, every part of science, they was to come together in sort of a an equal playing field in a sense. So you found <clears throat> you've you found these um 
you were speaking then about the uh, the chalk. Um, cr- God, I'm trying to learn all this information is making my brain hurt. Um, the these all these plants that have been fossilized due to the uh, the, the chalk spray. I don't know how to describe yeah, it. Yeah, the, the geyser. Sort the geyser. Of that was it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you were, you found them as well, and um, yeah, continue on with uh, some more. Things yeah, so it. you can you can go into sort of like the geological history uh, just for the British Isles. You you wouldn't believe it, but the British Isles was made up of sixteen different islands. Really? Wow. Yeah. And basically, over a period of about fifty million years, um, Scotland and um, several parts of England, um, the Isle of Wight was once connected, obviously, but with with rising sea levels and and ice ages, and it's it's one of the reasons why we still experience earthquakes. Yeah, you know, you, you get them down in um, down in Lands End. You know, it's only like three or four. It's nothing, nothing big. But the reason is that faults still exist from fifty million years ago because yeah. of those faults that separated Ireland from Britain. Mm. Basically, if you can imagine, the whole British Isles was one island at one point, just the same as the world. You mm. know, everybody thinks, oh, we've only ever had one supercontinent. We've mm. actually had four. Really? Yeah. The oh. amount of times that. Uh, countries have come together and then split in loads of different. Is that due to volcanoes segments. as well as uh, earthquakes and all these sorts of uh, gigant, like gargantuan sort of, not even anomalies, just things that happen in life? You think a lot of people don't realize with earthquakes, like a small earthquake or medium sized earthquake, they can have repercussions. But when you get these absolutely colossal ones or super volcanoes, can they have super volcanoes on certain planets that can just turn the entire planet into just volcanic ash? Like yeah. because they're so colossal mm. that they have a, such a huge amount of magma and. Um, lava within them that it just can cover a whole thing so people underestimate some of the the craziness of the almost natural disasters in air quotes because mm. of like w- with people like there's extinction events as well that people don't think about where people go oh yeah there's that one with the dinosaurs with the meteor so well that was one that we know of there are there could have been hundreds if not thousands that we know of. i think we know of a few don't there's we? eight major ones that we know of yeah so what when we uh go into them then a little bit of you, okay. your knowledge of them so what you have um you have three just in the Devonian period. That's basically where we start seeing the rise of bony fish. You have okay. yeah. armor-plated fish like Dunkleosteus, um, uh, Lepidectes, just to name a few. Um, and basically, that was basically a mass extinction. It was, it was nothing major. You sort of had basically uh, a global anoxia event, if you mm-hmm. can believe as such, where all the oceans became anoxic. Right. No oxygen whatsoever. Basically, it was a biological turnover. Yeah. So all the decaying organisms that had settled at the bottom of the ocean had basically risen to the top and the microorganisms that were then using it to um, make energy from, the gas that they produced, the the sulfur dioxide that they were producing was sufficient enough that it caused a 35% decrease in all life in the oceans. Okay. You then go into one at the end of the uh, Permian. Yep which was an absolutely devastating mass extinction that wiped out 95% of all life on earth jesus there right. are so many different theories of what it was hmm. even up to the point of a gamma ray burst basically they, is that like a from like a from like the, the solar sun. effect yeah 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 gamma radiation being yeah obviously something that can kill relatively everything yeah 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 basically um they they theorize that that's why trilobites are black because literally they were just <laughs> cooked oh wow okay yeah. um and they've also found an iridium spike um, round about the Permo-Triassic border as well. So, you know, there's there's been theories of uh, a supermassive volcano erupting, which brought about an ice age, a miniature ice age, hmm. um, to uh, a meteorite impact, to again another global anoxia event. You know, um, we're aware of six times that the, the ocean actually became fully anoxic. And you, you just think the size of the ocean... You think, how, how is that even possible with ocean circulation and all that kind of stuff? How is it even? But then you move into the Carboniferous. There was one that occurred at the end of the Carboniferous. Um, the idea was that because of all the free oxygen that was in the atmosphere, um, obviously there was a depletion in greenhouse gases. Mm-hmm. Um, this is one of the reverse effects of if you get too aware of greenhouse gases. They are good for the planet because mm-hmm. they maintain a certain amount of heat. Um, not to the point as is today. <laughs> the The only difference being is we're burning millions of years worth of fuel that should be released over millions of years in a few hundred years. Yep. That's why we're experiencing problems. But the idea is that it caused such a, a cool sort of temperature 
that it dramatically changed climate. That's why the Triassic is associated with deserts. Mm. Like everywhere you look, everything is desertified simply because it dried out. You know, and you think, well, if it cooled the temperature down, how the hell did it dry everything out? Well, think about it. If you're, you're cooling stuff down, you're making more ice, there's less water into the um, environments, mm -hmm. less water able to uh, filtrate into them, so you have less fertile soil, bang, you've got deserts everywhere. Mm. Um, then you have one in the early Jurassic, which again was brought on by uh, either a meteorite impact or just climate change in general. Then you have one at the end of the Jurassic, uh, which was brought on by, again, anoxic events. Uh, and the interesting part was uh, bringing it back onto the ichthyosaur that we found. She was smack dab in the middle of that mass extinction event, so it could have really? been what killed her. Oh, wow. Um, that's why when you go to areas like Dorset and you, you look into uh, the Black Ven, that's why it's called the Black Ven, because it has so much organic matter in it, because literally everything was just wiped out. Mm. Um, so it all just settled, and that's why it's a, it's a black shell. Um, when you sort of take it off the cliff, it's almost oily, okay. uh, because it's got so much organic uh, matter uh, preserved in it. Mm. And then obviously you have, they say it's the KT event, it's more the KPG, because you've got the, the cretaceous paleogene border. Everyone says it's 65 million years ago. You can agree with that. That's fine. It's actually 65.3 if you want to get technical about it. <laughs> the idea is there are loads of different theories. There are paleontologists um, that I know down at Portsmouth University that will literally argue until they're blue in the face to say it was not a meteorite. You can believe it was. Um, the, the one thing about being a paleontologist is you cannot say with 100% certainty this caused a mass extinction. Mm. It was a series of events that were probably triggered by every single one of them. Mm. They all collaborated together to cause this mass extinction. Mm. It's not a nuke. You can't plan when it's going to go off. You can't plan how many things it's going to kill. Well, sometimes it can be like huge amounts of almost, I don't necessarily believe in luck, but you can almost say something really unlucky. Like, you know, you can have a star uh, explode galaxies away mm -hmm. it can cause a one of some of the planets to burst or explode or whatever a shard of rock could fly off that and by somewhere being affected by numerous black holes and other gravitational pools and things it just happens to hit earth mm -hmm. and it happens to hit say the polar ice caps that will then release a flood and then that's a that's a theory that some people have where as a meteorite hit the um hit some of the polar ice caps that cause a mass flood event well that Things like that, where it's one event triggers another one, you could just you could almost have an infinite ripple effect of yeah, that caused that flood, which caused this cliff over here to fall down, which caused uh, this happened, and then that caused this to happen, and all these cliff sides then fell, but that tremor caused the tectonic plates to shift a bit more, which caused another earthquake, and you could say this one thing that happened caused five or six other things to happen, which then would have caused the mass extinction event, mm -hmm. and there's also some arguments for um, lots of people say humans we're so we're so thinking we're going to live forever. All it would take is one decently sized meteor. To, like Jupiter's been protecting us from quite a few of them. But it's like, it would take one big-ish meteor to hit planet Earth and it would cause such a massive it's a ripple almost. It would just destroy all life on it like that. But also what people don't think about with mass extinction events, not only people think a lot of them are going to be man-made, like, you know, uh, Donald Trump and King John Un doing dick measuring contests and nuking each other, which is a possibility. Uh, there's also super diseases, you know, because of the antibiotics and stuff that we're overusing, we're becoming, uh, the diseases like the super flu and things like that are becoming not uh they're becoming less susceptible to all the uh, medicine we have for them so therefore they're becoming we can't do anything about them and then if there's just one global pandemic that if it got the right amount of airborne sort of infectious nurse i'm not very good with the terminology uh mixed with how lethal it is it could wipe relatively every human out it could wipe out any like avian flu a uh, flu was a thing as was um swine flu all these sorts of other things that people don't really think about is that there are so many things that could wipe out life on Earth. Whether there's the there's the I think Yellowstone's got an active uh, volcano, isn't it? And um, I think is it Lanzarote, I think it is, or Grand Canaria, one of the two. They've got uh, an active volcano there, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to erupt, but that doesn't mean it won't. It could take an under sh under sh uh, under sea uh, earthquake with tectonic plates under their movement, and that could cause just because where well, obviously volcanoes have to go down to, to to the core to get all the magma and stuff. Mm -hmm. If there was some sort of earthquake or even if there's a tsunami that was wrong that then hit some of the rock out of the way or something, all these possibilities that can just make one thing happen, chain of events. Exactly. And it's, it's crazy to think about. And with paleontology, what it can show you is the sheer 
mass possibility of not only what was and what could have been, but also what caused what to happen. As you say, with the with the um, uh, either 150 or 510 million year old the pollen um, mm. things, you say how old they were and like how these plants can just affect everything around them and just these these tight things that may seem like tiny uh, discoveries can even if there's a tiny discovery now you could go you know years and years down the future and then this discovery you've made now could have actually been the thing that made this super discovery or whatever mm. so the more you talk about paleontology the more excited i am it just sounds so amazing and it's so interesting to be able to have someone to talk about it with it's it's fantastic um so we've spoken about the, some of the mass extinction events and whatnot and um so what is there a specific field in uh, in paleontology that really calls out to you, like either a time period or a certain type of uh, plant or animal, anything that's that really kind of hooked you? Yeah, it's, um, it's the Jurassic period, definitely, because um, obviously that's where uh, the ichthyosaur comes from. Mm. Um, and mostly that, that's where dinosaurs are sort of coming into their heyday, you know, um, but also what they're sharing the, the planet with, you know, we're, we're seeing the development of flight for the first time and not just gliding, but powered flight. But also going back into the Carboniferous um, and even the the early Eocene, I'm fascinated with fossil insects. Anything mm. to do with fossil insects, whether it's in amber, whether it's in um, sandstone preservation, whatever it is, mm. I just it just absolutely fascinates me. You know, the fact that back in the Carboniferous, there were tarantulas that if they were around today, they'd be hunting cats. Yeah. You know, we had dragonflies like Meganura that had a meter long wingspan you mm. had um i've heard about these super insects and stuff yeah yeah you had arthropleura which was a six foot long centipede yeah you know they were massive absolutely massive animals because of the oxygen levels and the fact that they didn't have any natural predators it enabled them to get so large but even going forward you know uh we went to germany as part of our paleontology uh, course we went to a place called Mesel in Germany and it was this it was this uh, fossil lake mm. and inside were preserved um, about 38 million year old insects and they still had color on their elytra you know, their wing cases oh wow and you were able to see like such detail in these fossil insects and and the fossil preservation was so good that they're able to take it to you know the hadron collider yes. in um, the in the Switzerland, I think it's yeah, Switzerland stuff. Yeah, um, they have another facility in there that allows you to blast electrons at a fossil, and it three dimensionally maps it. Oh, okay, basically. awesome. And they were able to do that with a lot of these insects, and they've actually mapped the internal structure. Really, of a lot of these insects. So the way they're doing they're them. basically their their insides work and mm, stuff like that. Yeah. So literal, almost it's almost like having one there. Almost like exactly. it's like a like a digital. Uh, What's the word when you open things up and stuff? Like you look inside. Yeah, like a digital vivisection. That's the word. I just couldn't think of it. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal technology these days, and how far much farther it's going to go. Mm. But so some of the some of those gigantic insects, like um, I know I'm not the biggest fan of this film, but uh, King Kong mm. would be an example of. In, in the movie King Kong, not the new one, which is actually quite good, the old one with Jack Black in it that's not that great, um, they go into that pit, which is probably the only good part of the whole film, where they've got all these giant bugs. And I, I imagine a lot of people look at them like, what's a giant bug? What's that all about? And it's like, because... This earth, we like to think of it the way we look at it now is the way it's always been, mm. which is not the case. Because not only with the oxygen levels, with all the different continents and stuff, with all the different the amount of moisture in the air, every sort of tiny little... That, that's what climate change is, why it's such a big thing, where people really don't understand. They go, oh, one or two degrees, what difference does that make? So that's, that's a global average, but it's like even a few degrees can be the difference between certain insects thriving or dying. Mm-hmm. Like I think the gender of... So a lot of uh, semi-aquatic animals, I think turtles are, have this, where the temperature where they lay their eggs actually determine the gender of the... The child. Yeah. It's not actually to do with, like, average mammals. Most of... I think most mammals have this, where it's basically just the, the male, the female, one of the two. It has the... I think humans, it's the male, basically, the, the gender is determined by the sperm. Mm. Um, and that obviously makes whatever. It's almost like a flip of a coin in a sense. But obviously, if you go back to genealogy, you go back to... If, if you've got a, a family, like my family, primarily a male, so they've given... You, know, you think that the likelihood is it's probably going to be males. But with when you go to climate change and you go into the repercussions of that, as well as you know destroying habitats, you could make it so that if... I can't remember which way around it is. I'm not sure if you know with uh, turtles. If it's too hot, it makes females, or too cold, it makes males, or whatever it is. Well, if for, if for example it's too hot and they only make females, well, they can't 
if the species will become extinct mm. and people don't realize that's only a couple of degrees whereas when you get these either mass events or mass extinction events where just all it takes is one volcano to shoot enough ash into the sky to block out the sun to reduce the global temperature by x amount or have not enough of this vitamin in there either it makes certain animals or plants adapt and evolve in different ways they they wouldn't have normally gone down mm. or it can just wipe them out completely and then when you wipe them out completely it's almost like a a vacuum because people say like you know if we killed say all the bugs obviously this bugs are probably the most important things on the whole planet but if we just say we killed all of the natural uh food of one bird well that's not just affecting the bird and the, the insect that you'd be mm. killing anyway it's the bird all the predators of the bird all the pollination that happens because of the birds all of the mm. everything that that these type of birds do the sort of the ripple effect of everything and that's what i keep saying is ripple effect because people need to understand that not only in their own lives but in the whole world is that every action has in a sense like that that you know an equal to negative sort of reaction you can think of it in the physicist sort of way mm. but even think of it as just if something happens, it's going to affect something else. Yeah. Very, very simply. So with all these sorts of learning about paleontology, you can learn almost what not to do, in a mm -hmm. sense. And that's why I imagine you're quite passionate about climate change, in the sense that I, I am, and I don't even know that much about it, to be honest. But it's just like all these things where people are either saying, oh, it's not a big deal, or it's not happening like this, not like that. It's like you don't understand the repercussions of if it is happening, which I'm pretty fucking certain it is, and especially pretty certain it is because of us it's being accelerated. Mm -hmm. It's it's going to make things uh, evolve in different ways. It's going to make potential things die in other ways. It's going to change the uh, the landscape of Earth, mm. most likely for the worse. But it's going to change it some way or another. And, and when it changes it and when certain animals change, if it makes it so that a certain animal is no longer as much of a hunter, then it means that its prey may become overrun and then that could end up killing that species of by starvation or disease Um or it could end up making that one thrive, and then it could end up making other animals that didn't normally eat them eat them, and then it could make that animal population thrive because there's so much more of a food source. And it's just, every way you look at it, it's, it's just there's so many other things that can affect other stuff, and it's just, yeah, what you've been saying is yeah. just fantastic. A great representation of that, you know, just as, as classic as the film is, is A Day After Tomorrow. Yeah. It perfectly encapsulates just how fragile the balance is. You know, just adding one part per meter squared of fresh water can be enough to tip the balance to actually have that occur mm -hmm. you know people just don't realize that but the you want you want facts we are wiping out 13 species of animal a day yeah you know and and for all the species that have yet to be discovered most of them we won't discover because we will have wiped them out before we even had a chance to stumble upon them mm. and a lot of people don't realize with um with, with a lot of the, the sciences is one of the arguments from um not to not to paint the same brush of everyone religious obviously but there are a lot of religious uh, organizations and things that seem to act like when you try and explain evolution to them they go mm. scientists act like they have all the answers it's like no we don't well, yeah. not, i'm not scientists <laughs> so i haven't got you are but uh, it's like we don't know anything as was said as i said earlier on like we we think what we know is true but we're not certain but with the uh, species like I think it's like with um, with insects we've only actually discovered such a small like percentage of what mm. actual insects there are because it's almost it's it's not quite like this but it's almost like every time you have a group of uh scientists um or paleontologists or anything go into the amazon rainforest for a couple of months they almost always discover new insects and stuff yeah. you because you can't you, you have to think about how vast their certain places are of that we haven't seen like even the ocean mm. like we've we know less about our own ocean than we do about i think the moon mm. Yeah, uh, it's like how can we think that? It's like well, because there's so many parts of the ocean we haven't discovered, and so much of what life came from was the ocean. Like mm. I think the, the the most common theory is basically all life originated, yeah. started in the ocean, mm. and then it kind of went from there. And then eventually, uh, creatures learned to kind of go out of the water either momentarily or for certain things, and then eventually became land dwellers mm. and da da da. So it's just like we know so little, which is what makes this they're so interesting of you can study this for your entire life and even if you only study it broadly the amount of insects that get discovered daily the amount of species that we discover of certain like even just slight variations of creatures we already know exist not just insects but also other beings you know another type of uh, marmoset or another type of this or another type of that just even knowing it's just this knowledge and what is so interesting to me is i love learning knowledge and new stuff and 
they're the animal kingdom. It's so majestic. Some of the coolest animals. Humans are pretty cool. Like we've we've done some pretty cool shit. Let's be fair. You know, <laughs> we made the Terminator movies. They're fucking cool. Um, but, you know, we made Shawshank Redemption. That's a great movie too. But like, you go down of all the great things we've done and all the horrible things you've done. But then you go to like all these beings that they don't care or have any interest in what humans have done, whether or not they even have the basis of consciousness in the same way, we're not fully sure. But some of the insect world is so intriguing. Like, one of the main ones I bring up is um, the praying mantis. You know, the, the female mates of the male, they cut off their head. That's, yeah. that's part of it. You have other ones like... Um, you have a type of wasp that um, injects its prey with its eggs, and then mm-hmm. it, I think it's paralyzed, isn't it? From yeah. the and it can't move, and then its larva is in the the wasp injects something. Often spiders, I think, quite regularly. Yeah. I think they're called something. That's tarantula hawk wasp. There we go. See, so, yeah, I've got little bits of information. I've got the whole picture, and they yeah they so they sting the 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 uh, tarantulas. They become paralyzed, but they're still alive. So that they put the, plant their larva within them, and then the larva eat them from let's see the inside out, and it's like. First of all, that's obviously horrendously fucked up and horrendous. <laughs> but that is so unbelievably cool that evolution basically went that way mm-hmm. and made just that one bug or one insect rather do that. Mm-hmm. And then you just think of all the other crazy ways of, of like there's bees when they have like um, hornets uh, invade their hives and stuff. They do that thing where they all latch onto them and they all vibrate and move really quick. Yeah. yeah, and they create such heat that it cooks them. And it's like. Bees. Bees are so awesome at making honey and all the craziness and bees are awesome animals anyway. And they literally all just pile on something and create enough heat energy to have cooked them. It's like, that's so amazing. That's so cool. You watch it, it's freaky as hell because watching all those bees swarm over something is awful to think about happening to you. But like, you have ants that are the hive mind. You have those, I think I mentioned it in a podcast a couple of times before where you get the... um, uh, you get that kind of, uh, I think it's a fungus that goes into the, it, it makes a sapling into the ant's mind and then it makes them crawl up really high. Concepts. There you go. And it makes them, you know, it, it takes over their, their essential function of their, mm-hmm. their motor function stuff. So it just makes the ant just crawl up as high as it will go to the closest thing of sunlight and just stay there and it dies and the plant grows out mm-hmm. their head. Mm-hmm. And that's like, there's so, there's, you, we could sit here for hours and hours and hours and just talk about all the cool shit that even just the insect kingdom and even mm-hmm. fungus and stuff can do. Um, so we're getting closer to the hour mark now, um, which I, I think I could talk to you about this for constantly. So maybe we'll have to visit it back and have a bit more of a, a structure, see what we can figure out. But um, as a little wrap up, do you have um, a favourite animal? I know it's probably knowing so many is quite difficult. How about a favourite animal, if you can think of this, that's potentially alive today, animal or insect, and maybe one of the favourites that's now extinct? And we can kind of finish it off as that sort of thing, and you can tell me the reasons why. Uh, my favourite animal uh, still extant, uh, so alive today, is the snowy owl, just because it's freaking awesome. I love been, owls. Snowy I've owls are my favourite as well, interested actually. in owls. Uh, they've always represented uh, wisdom, and in uh, Swedish folklore, they were always the um, passage of uh, soul to the afterlife, which mm. I always thought was awesome as well. Yeah. Um, but snowy owls, they, they just look so graceful. Mm. Like, everything about them is just amazing. You look them at... Um, wind escapes and that kind of thing they're, they're pretty cool um, as far as extinct um, I absolutely love glyptodons they're like the cousin of the armadillo but they were the size of a car oh wow basically they were part of the megafauna that existed in South America um, during the Paleogene um, which was literally just after the Cretaceous you know so you had this mass extinction of a of a meteorite because all those niches were then removed you had this armadillo growing to that sort of size but the awesome thing was it had a club on the end of its tail which weighed half a ton oh wow it was freaking awesome and they find them fossilized in sort of uh river deposits but the um the shell is upside down because obviously there's so much hollow space in inside them that Mm. when they drowned they literally just sailed so you just (laughs) imagine these these dead glyptodons just piling up against each other trying to get out to the ocean type thing so you're like oh man that's awesome (laughs) oh those those animals that's fantastic i mean one of the things you say about owls i mean whenever i try to think my favorite animal i often can't fully figure out i have to write it down and work it out because i said with um with josh one of our science but simple episodes we're probably going to um do like our favorite animals and stuff so maybe i'll uh get you in on that and um one of the things is uh, with owls, as you say, one of the cool things I found out about owls is 
they're not actually ironically they're not necessarily that smart in terms mm. of the bird world because they actually have quite small brains comparatively because you think if you see the owl's head and you think oh they've got quite big brain because mm. that's generally speaking how things work with the animal kingdom the bigger your head is the bigger your brain is but it's because their eyes are so huge in their head because they're so good their mm. eyes are so amazing because obviously they can see in the dark and they can see so far and you have to see a tiny scutter of a rodent movement seeing a blade of grass move in a different way to the way all the wind's making it move mm. and all these sort of amazing things that they have and they can't look with their eyes in a different way that's why they can turn their head almost 360 because yeah. they have to be able to move their head because they can't actually move their eyes in their sockets mm. and it's like you could we have an hour long chat about owls and it would be <laughs> awesome it's just like there's so many cool things in the animal world and stuff so you know this has been incredibly enlightening I'm going to have to listen back to this to try and pick up all the information because there's so much to take in but it's, it's been fantastic having you on and chatting about this and I'll definitely have to inquire about you coming on in the future and teaching us more about animals with Josh's uh, degree in marine biology mixed with your degree in paleontology that's just I'm going to have to accumulate all these really smart people that know lots about animals and I could just sit in the middle and know barely anything like I like pandas I quite like them even though they're very stupid animals who really should be extinct by now but we keep letting them not be extinct and it's like oh, I don't want pandas to be extinct because they're great but they don't even really want to mate ever mm. and they're so lazy and they're so difficult to make mate they're going to be gone at some point yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah absolutely stellar having you on as I said at the start we've done two podcasts one about the two books you've written and the series that you're uh, the book series that you're making and the intricate details of the sort of uh, the dichotomy between good and evil in the male in the male and the human psyche as well as just the human condition and in sort of a, a spiritual sense as well as just moral morality and all these sorts of interesting things that we spoke about in the first podcast so i'd say to anyone go out check out those books and check out the podcast and then this one all about paleontology so once again thank you very much for coming on wayne it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on it's been a pleasure to be here thank you And that's the end of another episode. Thanks, as always, for tuning in, guys. Um, as I said at the start, um, I've got another podcast with Wayne, which was the one released last week. Um, this That one is about kind of like the opposite side of the spectrum, in a sense. It's actually about um, the human condition, people, uh, good versus evil. Um, we talk um, about Wayne's two books that he's written there, fiction books, set in the 19th century, uh, following a sort of uh, Jekyll and Hyde sort of story. I don't want to give too much away because we speak about it quite a lot on the podcast. And we also talk about inspiration and how Wayne wants to spread this message of hope, which I found was just amazing. So I really uh, highly recommend you guys check that out. And the other ones I mentioned at the start of the podcast were Science But Simple. Uh, I've got two episodes of those released at the moment, the first one being How Light Bulbs Work. Um, it's a real easy to understand way of just describing energy in a quite a simple way. Uh, and then the second one is about gravity, the tides and the moon. Um, they're both uh, about an hour long, a little bit under I think. And I discuss science things with basically my buddy Josh, who's uh, got a degree in marine biology. Um, so he knows way more about science and all that sort of stuff than I do, as you could have probably heard from this uh, episode with Wayne. Wayne knows infinitely more about it, but that's good, because him, both uh, Wayne and Josh do have degrees in science, so you'd hope for them to know more than just I do. Um, and a new one me and Josh will be releasing, I believe it's actually going to be next week, um, is basically debunking uh, misconceptions and um, we speak about uh gmo which is genetically modified organisms you know when people worry about food and stuff like that that's gmo uh, we speak about cancer and some of the sort of misconceptions with that as well as big pharma and the whole sort of drug industry of sort of how like medicines actually made rather than there's a lot of people who think that there's a cure for cancer out there and it's just the big pharma companies are hiding it from us uh, and which obviously we can't prove isn't happening but we talk in depth about that sort of thing and why we believe it couldn't be and that how they make medicine and sort of it's just debunking really uh scientific things um there's only, there's the three major parts of it so that'll be um as the three major things we debunk uh in the episode and we talk about that next week um and then the coming weeks um over the next two months i'm recording i think i've got seven or eight podcasts uh listed for recording i'm hoping they'll each be uh one to two hour ones so i may be able to split uh quite a few of them so i should have a lot of podcasts uh sorted out for this coming year some of them are I'm really excited for some of them. Some of the guests I've got are really cool. Um, so, you know, as always, guys, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, any of the podcast apps, including Stitcher or Podbean or anything like that. It really goes a long way to help. Um, leaving reviews as well is a fantastic way for, to let me know sort of how I'm doing, um, be it on iTunes, or you can email us at genuine 
chit chat at outlook.com uh, the links and that sort of stuff will be in the description of the episode uh, and on all the social media you can normally find a way you can message me on any of the social media anything like that at all i welcome any and all feedback really so yeah um as always guys thanks for tuning in and i'll talk to you next week